everyone no doubt is aware uh, Ethereum gas fees have skyrocketed and uh, this is making ENS name registrations uh, much more expensive than we'd like um, and also updates of records and so forth and uh, coincidentally with this uh, L2s are starting to launch and uh, becoming a more viable option for, for reducing L1 gas costs. Uh, so we've been working for a while now since uh, late last year on uh, a particular approach uh, for uh, L2 integration of the ENS originally suggested by Vitalik Buterin um, and have put together a couple of progressively more complex demos uh, and uh, I'm now at the point where we feel like we can start work on standardization efforts. Um, it would probably help if I, uh, to start, if I go over the um, the basic idea uh, behind our L2 efforts, and then I can demo uh, what we've built so far. Uh, so, excuse me one second. Here we go. So this is the repository for our uh, layer two gateway demo so far. Um, and this diagram here is showing the basic uh, control flow for uh, ENS L2 integration. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, what we want to facilitate is resolving ENS names uh, using an L2 or resolving ENS names that are stored on an L2 uh, without the caller uh, who's doing the resolving having to know which L2 it is or care about how it communicates or anything like that. Um, so everything should look like a simple transparent name resolution, um, but the end result is that they can get back a resolved name uh, with assurances that it's correct. So what we've uh, formulated, again, based on Vitalik's original suggestion and then expanding and improving and generalizing on that, is a multi-step process. Uh, you query the original contract, which in this case is the ENS resolver for the name you want to look up, uh, asking it uh, what is the, say, the address of nick.eth. Um, and instead of giving you an answer back directly, it returns a, a gateway URL uh, and a prefix, which we'll describe later. Um, and then the original caller now queries the gateway URL. So they go and make an HTTP request to the layer two gateway with the URL they were given from the resolver contract. Um, and they ask it uh, the same question again, you know, what is the address for nick.eth for instance? Uh, and it returns back a chunk of data and the chunk of data is opaque uh, to the caller. So they don't have to know what it is or care what's in it. Finally, in the third step, they take that data they were given um, they first check that uh, it starts with the prefix they were originally given, and this is a guarantee that uh, proves that the gateway was actually answering the question you asked rather than answering some other question honestly. And then finally, you take that opaque data and you send it back to the original resolver contract that you asked for the gateway address from, and you ask it to verify that, and it verifies it and returns the result. Um, and the, the way this works means that the uh, it's possible to write a resolver contract that farms out all of the sort of the work of storage and resolution to an L2 via a gateway, but doesn't add trust assumptions because the if the gateway lied, then the uh, resolver, when it was asked to verify the result, would be able to detect that. Um, and the benefit, of, the other benefit of this is that it is entirely generic. It doesn't depend on any particular L2 uh, architecture. It doesn't depend on any particular communication protocol. Uh, we can author a gateway for, for any L2. And for that matter, you could author a gateway for things that aren't L2s. Um, you can uh, effectively use this as a generic communication interface um, to any system you wish, uh, with the caveat that you only get the security guarantees that that interface provides. So if, for instance, you use this to build a gateway to optimism, uh, you do so with no additional trust assumptions. So tr optimism is already designed to be theoretically uh, trustless on top of Ethereum, and you can do all the verification necessary to know that the results uh, have that same trust model uh, when you fetch them from Optimism. If, on the other hand, you wanted your gateway to be a gateway to, say, a DNS service or a database you have on a server somewhere, then you can do that. But of course, the guarantees the caller gets are much weaker. They're just, it is what I say it is. Um, but it's a very flexible model that permits this to, to work for just about anything. Um, 
So we have a full end-to-end -end demo of this using Optimism's uh, integration repository, their test, uh, their their local testing environment, uh, which I finished building recently, and I'm pleased to be able to show off for the first time ever today. So let's do that now. Uh, first of all, um, we need to bring up a few services. So here's my terminal. Uh, here we have checked out a copy of the Optimism Integration Repository, which I've previously Sorry, are you, are you yeah. sharing? Yeah. All right, yep, it's taking a while to set up. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah, you can see it now. This is cool. historic, everybody, by the way. <laughs> Glad everyone's here to see it. Uh, so here we have a copy of Optimism's Integration Repo, which is a, a service that will run uh, an L1 node, an L2 node, and all the necessary services to talk between them. Basically, when you bring this up uh, like this, you are bringing up an Optimism testnet uh, on your local machine. Uh, previously, I've built it and fetched everything, so it won't take an age, but it will take a little while. Um, it spins up on L2, it spins up a custom geth instance, and on L1, it's just a, a Ganache instance. Uh, and so we'll wait a moment for those to be connected. Uh, and the various contract transactions you can see here are the integration repository deploying all of the optimism contracts and so forth to, to L1 and to L2. There we go, it's all deployed. So now in another tab, we've got our demo and we will um, change into the contracts directory. Uh, this is a standard hard hat, uh, contra uh, hard hat uh, contract repository and it has uh, re contracts for uh, layer one and layer two. Um, and we will deploy both of these to the L1s and L2s from the Optimism node we just spat up. So so what we're doing now is we're deploying to L1, we are deploying an entire ENS deployment. So the ENS registry, uh, a resolver and so forth. Uh, or at least we would be if things were working properly. Uh, and yep, that's definitely pre-coffee for me. That is not a shell script. Um, and then to layer two, we are deploying a, a layer two specific optimism resolver. And I'll show everyone the code for these a little bit later. So the resolver has been deployed to uh, L2. Uh, the, uh, we've set a, a, a test address on it. Uh, we've deployed the registry and the stub, which is the L1 version of the resolver to L1. Uh, so next we need to run our gateway service. Uh, and again, apologies because it is very much pre-coffee for me here. So if I screw things up, that's why. Uh, so this is the gateway service that talks to the Optimism L2 and to our L1 and answers ENS specific queries uh, for based on the, the resolver that's passed in. And then finally, uh, we run a simple uh, local web server um, so that we can serve up the, um, uh, the test interface that I've got here to demonstrate the whole thing end to end. Uh, so I will stop showing you my terminal window and show you the demo in a browser. And hopefully that starts sharing soon. There we go. So here we have our very unglamorous looking uh, L2 demo. Um, this uh, conducts the process of resolving a, uh, a name via L2 in an unnecessarily uh, laborious and step-by-step -step process so that everyone can actually see what's happening rather than I just click a button and I assure you it works. So we're pasting in here the name of the, uh, the address of the ENS registry we deployed on L1. Of course, this would be built into resolvers in general. Um, we're entering the name we want to resolve. So the first step is the same as for ENS in general. And this is somewhat embarrassing because it appears to be broken. One moment. Are you connecting to uh, like right? Uh, yes, RPC? thank you. This is this is exactly the thing Makoto read into it. He attempted to reproduce it, and that I uh, completely failed to 
uh, remember to do myself. Have to connect to the appropriate network first, of course. So we paste in the address there. Uh, we enter the, the address we want to resolve. So the first step is the same as with ENS. Uh, since we've launched, uh, you call the registry and you get back the resolver address. Uh, the second step is where things change. You call the uh, resolver and you get back the uh, HTTP address of the gateway, which is the one we're running on our local machine, and the prefix that the gateway response should have. Uh, so as I described earlier, these prefixes and responses are opaque to the caller in general, but for the purposes of the demo, we're decoding them to show you what's inside so that you can see what sort of happens at all layers. But if you were a generic caller, all you would know is that it's a blob of data that starts with some specific thing. So now we have a gateway address, we can query the gateway, and we get back this rather large blob of data. Um, so this is uh, formatted as a call to the original resolver contract uh, to a function called adder with proof. Uh, it has the uh, the node, which is the name hash of test.test, .test, uh, which we were told to expect. So the first thing the client does is it checks that the call doesn't start, indeed start with those bytes. And then it has a bunch of optimism specific stuff. So in this case, it has a proof struct. Uh, the proof uh, has several components. It's proving that uh, the state root of a particular block on optimism is a particular hash. And then it's proving that the uh, state try at that root contained a particular account. And then it's proving that that account, uh, which is the account of the resolver contract, contained a particular storage value. Sorry, that one there. Uh, and with all of those proofs together, by consulting the uh, optimism uh, contract, it's possible to uh, prove conclusively that that optimism contract had that particular value in that particular storage slot, which we've calculated as where the, the answer to our query should be stored. So finally, we run process gateway response. We go off and we can uh, we consult the uh, resolver contract again, and we back, get back uh, the address that the ENS name resolved to. So unglamorous, but uh, exciting in its own way, I think, because it's uh, we're actually for the first time ever resolving an ES name via a layer two solution. Um, I'll go over the contract Ooh. code <laughs> briefly, but uh, yeah. before I do, does anyone have any questions about what I've shown so far? Uh, I don't see any hands up, so let me uh, go over the, the contract. It looks like uh, uh, Andreas, did you want to say something? Oh, apologies. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it's coming up later. Uh, but I, I noticed uh, the response was in uh, in JSON format. I, are we supposed to parse the JSON in in Solidity or uh, uh, to resolve the res? Yeah. So so basically, this is just my decoding of the uh, of the Solidity call. Um, I, I just used JSON primitives because it was the easiest way to just display it uh, with labels that are readable. Um, but in general, you get back an opaque blob, you pass the blob to the resolver, and the uh, Solidity's ABI decoding takes care of actually interpreting it. Um, I just thought that a demo where you see, you know, two kilobytes of hex would not be uh, terribly uh, interesting or useful. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. But I think uh, one of the implication based on Andreas' question is that one of the limitations that we can't do the on-chain name resolution anymore. Before, we could have done that, though no one does it. But now, like, it's partially bit impossible because you have to hit the gateway address. Yes, so if a, if a name is uh, is on an L2, you can't do the entire of the name resolution in a single step from a contract. Uh, what you can do, however, is this can be turned into a non-interactive form. You can take the gateway response and pass that to something and allow it to uh, resolve the name on chain with your assistance effectively. So you say, here is a witness that proves that this name resolves to this value. Um, you just can't any longer go from just a name to a resolved address. Um, so hey, can I, can I say something real quick? Nick, this mm -hmm. was really great. Um, everybody who's watching this, note that this has not been like totally standardized yet. So like precisely if you see something, you're like, you know what, that's not going to make sense for us because we're a wallet provider and we know something you don't know, tell us 
because so Nick had this blog post he wrote a few months ago, kind of laying out the idea. He has this MVP kind of uh, showing it off. The next step is actually standardizing it. So we, we want people's feedback on what should the standard be. Yeah. And so the uh, our goal here has been develop this MVP first so that we can test things end to end and, and evaluate that the, the approach we think is sound is actually sound. And that now we've done that, we can start standardizing things. Um, and the, the first step in standardization, in fact, will be developing something that is uh, not even ENS specific, because the general primitive here is that you have a way to, uh, from an L1, query an L2, and get back a result that you can verify without the caller having to know which L2 it was or how it was verified, uh, which is particularly valuable for ENS because it relies on storing a, you know data uh, that can be updated in a sort of a distributed database fashion, but needs to be verified in a common way, but is potentially very valuable to other projects as well. Uh, and then step two is writing sort of ENS specific bindings for this protocol. Um, so to just finish going over the uh, this particular use of it, uh, the MVP, so to speak, um, this is the the resolver on optimism, and it is effectively the simplest possible contract. Uh, it's owned by one owner. Uh, that owner can set an address for a name, uh, and it sets a value in storage, uh, and you can fetch it. But when you're uh, doing generating the proof, what it's actually generating is proof that a particular storage slot in that contract has a particular value. Um, the L1 contract is a little more complicated, uh, but not enormously so. Um, in this case, it imports a whole lot of work from Optimism uh, and, and does uh, all of the verification through their libraries. Uh, so we have the original adder function, uh, which is called at the beginning to get the gateway URL and the prefix that's required. So in this case, it's saying that the gateway must return a call to adder with proof that starts with the node, the name that's being resolved. And then we have the adder with proof function. Uh, and so this function accepts the name that's being resolved and the proof. Uh, and it calls out to uh, verify state root proof, which goes off and consults optimism and says, is this really a state root for the OVM? Uh, and then it goes off and it uh, calls the uh, get storage value, which takes the other proofs, the proof of the um, state, uh, the, the, that an account is in the state root and the proof that a value is in the account uh, and uses those to fetch that value and return it um, using some secure Merkle try libraries that the Optimism folks have very kindly written for us. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking here 50 lines of code. This one's a little denser than the other one, but the, the basic integration, it, it builds heavily on the work that the L2 has done already. So the, the actual difficulty involved here is mostly sort of integration tooling rather than anything else. Uh, and I won't try and go through all of it, but I will briefly show people the um, gateway. Oops. Um, and just to emphasize, all of this is on GitHub at ENS domain slash L2 gateway demo in the optimism branch. Uh, I'll soon make that the master branch because their previous uh, version is now obsolete. Um, so the basic gateway functionality, there is a lot of boilerplate here, um, but the basic functionality is that uh, it gets called with the adder function. Um, it does a whole bunch of stuff to fetch and generate proofs from Optimism, but the fundamental work it's doing is it's calling fgetProof on the L2 chain to get back uh, a proof of the state root and the storage root. Uh, and then it's packaging all of that up in a big struct and returning it to the caller. Um, so again, you know, boilerplate aside, and a lot of this is stuff that uh, the Optimism team needs to package up into reusable libraries, and I unfortunately had to sort of pull out and shove in here because it's all very, very early so far. Um, the basic functionality is very simple and integration should, between different L2s should be relatively easy to build. Uh, so that concludes my presentation and, and first ever demo of resolving an ES name on an L2. Uh, questions? I think maybe we should just clap for you first. <laughs> yeah, <woo. laughs> A lot of silent clapping. <laughs> uh, I did want to ask about kind of the optimism rollout timeline, but that's probably after the more technical questions. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I can address it briefly in that they've uh, pushed their launch back uh, because they're trying to, to sort of uh, intensively support their first users. Um, I've been in conversations with them about whether we might be able to uh, become an early user, but that would be more likely for the DNS integration stuff uh, than for this, because the DNS integration stuff has the advantage that it just uses the primitives they already built around message passing and so forth. Uh, whereas what we're doing here, while we've been able to build it fairly easily on top of their primitives, is sort of reaching into their plumbing at a lower level. You know, we're we're doing direct state proofs and so on, which is kind of more more the plumbing than the porcelain. Uh, so probably more in the region of six months, I think. This is a non-technical question, but can we tweet this out? I feel like you have to dig around for like um, ecosystem advances for Ethereum. And I think this is like a pretty big thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And we were, uh, you know, that this was, this was the big demo. And after that, you know, we're going to be making a lot of noise about it as well. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, and again, I uh, forgive apologies if my pronunciation is off. Uh, Roven says, uh, what would the difference be to a ZK rollup? Um, it's in terms of uh, how ENS handles it, fairly minimal. Like it's all down to that plumbing and that in the, the resolver stub smart contract and the gateway of how they fetch and construct the proofs. Um, but the experience for the, the client resolving it is exactly the same. Uh, and the basic steps of you know of, of grabbing the proof and putting it together is is much the same. the The basic equation is that as long as you can verify the proof on the EVM, which is a necessary component for any L two, otherwise it wouldn't be an L two. Uh, you can build a gateway for this. Cool. Thanks. Uh, can you expand on the so kind of trade off? of what we lose. Like you, we already identified that you can't do everything in one transaction. What else which you can do right now can no longer do on this approach? I mean, the, the main issue is that it means that clients will need to be updated to support this new resolution process, uh, which means this, this whole three-step dance of call the original resolver, call the gateway, call the resolver again. Um, and that's going to be the first major change in how ENS names have resolved since we launched. Um, once they've done that, then their, their functionality is much expanded. I think the only thing we really uh, lose, so to speak, is, is that, as we've already identified, if you want to resolve a name on chain, entirely on chain, you'll have to be provided with this witness data uh, in order to do it. You won't be able to resolve the name uh, just you know, with the name and no other information. Uh, I think last time, last time I think I, I was, we we had a couple, of, you know, uh, meeting back in October, and uh, I remember that you in this demo you only use it L2 as a storage. You didn't put any logic, and uh, you know something like a wildcard. I think you had to move some logic to L1. Is it still the same? Yeah, that's a fair point. The that there is uh, there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of how much you rely on the L2 to do. So the most basic version, like I just demoed, uh, the L2 is just data storage effectively, or it's, it's permission data storage. Um, you can build a general purpose system like, you know, that th your ENS resolver can have any implementation, um, but that gets a lot more complicated because now the proof that you submit to L1 has to be a, a proof of execution effectively. It has to have everything necessary to re-execute the L2 resolver's code with the same data and get the same result, uh, which is again possible because that's how optimism handles disputes. Um, but it is vastly more complicated to to implement and uses a lot more uh, has a lot more overhead than a simple you know solution where you effectively use L two as as just data storage layer. Uh, and even if you do use an an, an L two that only supports data storage or use a more flexible one like Optimism only for data storage, uh, you can still get a lot of flexibility out of this. I, I have designs in my head at least for ways to structure the resolvers so that you can still have dynamic functionality uh, from your resolver, even though L2 is only storing data rather than executing it. Um, but things get a little more complicated. So we'll, we'll have to sort of dynamically find what the trade-off is between uh, making these systems simple and making them flexible. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Uh, you said um, that this approach is suitable for L2s where you can do the uh, check of the correctness on chain. Would you also consider it suitable for uh, side chains like uh, Matic or XDAI sort of uh, to, to, uh, to move it there and uh, kind of follow up? If there was already something maybe like a public resolver, could that be maybe something incorporated into a, I don't know, a, a uh, more close link between the side chain and the main chain where you would need um, have maybe uh, this maybe a hash or a root of a, of the third party public resolver somewhere yeah so the um uh, this is definitely possible with side chains and so forth and the, the nice thing is it preserve again it preserves the same security assumptions so in the case of say XDAI, you're basically relying on a consortium of signers to to act, you know, honestly in the majority, um, and so you could build a gateway that that uh, uses the solution and has the same assumption. Although, uh, you know, you would have to persuade those same signers to 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 um, do this for you. Uh, otherwise, your your assumption is different. It's that a different group of people, you know, honestly reports what's on XDAI. Um, but either way, you can build a solution that. That has a similar mechanic. So in that case, the um, the proof data return that opaque blob would basically be a bunch of signatures by the key holders saying, "I assert that the result of calling the smart contract function on XDI is this," um, and then the contract on L1, the resolved contract, would verify that. Mm. So if you were running a uh, sub uh, like a. Uh, a subdomain sort of approach, uh, then uh, that would be under co the control of a particular project anyway. So you could even rely on a single signature and it would even make sense sometimes, maybe not always. Yes, uh, so that, that very much depends on the uh, the trust model of your name. Uh, so if, for instance, you're operating, you know, your company's ENS name and you want to point at a website that's updated frequently, for instance, uh, then you should be perfectly happy with something that just accepts your signature that, you know, that the value is this off chain um, and your gateway that you operate that does that. Um, if, on the other hand, you're trying to issue subdomains to users and you want your users to be able to rely on having accurate resolution of them, then they probably want stronger trust guarantees than that, which is where using something like an L2 would be a, a better solution. So is it additional kind of responsibility for for example, X star is uh, before they have to have like a RPC endpoint enough to be able to for presenting transaction for bridging purpose. But now they have to have enough infrastructure to cope every read operation, which uh, could be a bit uh, tricky for them because they're already suffering with uh, lots of RPC downtime issues. So I don't know if any side chain can cope with that kind of level of request. It's so it's not a requirement specific to XDI in that anyone can run a gateway. Uh, and, and fortunately, you know, because of the, uh, the fact that all the, uh, the assumptions are verified by the resolver, you don't actually have to trust the gateway operator to do anything other than be available. Like if they return inaccurate data, you'll, you'll know. Um, but yes, somebody has to operate a gateway uh, that is, you know, has, is reliable and, and can query the, the L2 chain or the, the side chain or whatnot. Yeah, and the, uh, one thing to add to that is like I had a separate conversation with uh, a Matic Polygon team about like you know this approach, and uh, uh, they they are like plasma based, and then plus they own POS. Stuff. So if something like what Nick suggests for X die, they could do it now. Uh, if we want to do it more like the optimism way, uh, they don't have the ways to, so they can verify a transaction, but they can't verify the state. Uh, mm -hmm. Having said that, they you know recently announced that they become Polygon that they're going to support everything. So they last time I talked to them like about a couple of months ago, they are thinking about something similar to what uh, like all the uh, you know uh, roll up are uh, doing of like state proof uh, functionality. So once is when I discuss, it sounds like it's better to wait the solution they implement. Then we we can kind of resume the discussion. But that that's kind of state of where I did a quick research. Yeah, and the um, the other thing worth noting here is that the gateway uh, author and and to the degree they provide these as as toggles that can be changed, um, the uh, 
the user can choose their trust assumptions and their trade-offs. So for instance, in the, in the case of Optimism, uh, you can configure your resolver so that it only resolves names that are uh, using data that is um, uh, finalized, in which case it will take two weeks to update your name, but you have the same uh, level of trust assumption as L1 that the, the result is accurate. Uh, or you can set it so that it accepts the latest optimism state that's been committed to the chain, in which case, uh, you know, your your uh, trust assumptions are much weaker, but you get immediate results. Or you can go somewhere in between. You can say, I want data that's at most an hour old, or sorry, at least an hour old. And so therefore, there's been an hour for someone watching the optimism chain to have challenged an invalid result. Um, and you can pick that trade-off between recency and, and security as you wish. And of course, in the case of like a ZK roll-up, that may not even be necessary because uh, it may go final immediately. Um, but the same goes for uh, integrations with other platforms. You can build a simple but uh, lower uh, security gateway initially. And then as they develop better mechanisms for proving state and so forth, you can beef up your gateway and your resolver implementations to suit. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, so Reuven also asked, uh, isn't Optimism storing the data on L1? Uh, kind of. What they do is they log the contents of all transactions in a transaction body on L1, but it's not stored on L1, so it's not accessible there, and it's also a lot cheaper than if it was actually stored directly on L1. Um, and Jordan asks, uh, does the protocol support registering multiple gateway endpoints to help present, uh, reduce central points of failure? Uh, so there's a number of ways to handle that, and we haven't uh, sort of locked into stone any gateway protocol yet. Uh, if you return a single URL, then you can still write a resolver that, that does a round robin type thing and returns a different one each time. Uh, we could return an array of URLs. Personally, I think that's a little ugly because DNS itself is capable of you know returning multiple addresses for a name and so forth, and I'm not sure that it should be the client's job to manually fail over between them. Um, but this is a conversation we'll very much be having as part of the process of standardizing this uh, protocol. And I'm hopeful too that this, this protocol is generic enough that you can sort of wrap it up into a uh, call via L2 mechanism. So you could have an ABI that embeds you know, a, a, a flag that says this is resolved via L2. And then the, the web3.js or ethers.js or whatever your favorite library is would know that that means we do this whole three-step dance and you can do it for any uh, Web3 call and then ENS would just be building on top of that. Sorry, you're almost inaudible. I guess he's typing. Yeah. Uh, could you give us a little color on the composability between L1 and L2 for on-chain lookups? Uh, can you can you expand on your question? I mean, if I were to uh, put an ENS name in an L1 contract that were to query. Uh, maybe a subdomain that's persisted on an optimism on L2. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to grok with how the that would get queried. Yep. So it's uh, that's um, more or less what Makoto was talking about with the the limitations of this. And the the basic way it would work is that uh, your contract would have to accept an opaque blob of of witness data uh, and the, the original name. Uh, so in order to resolve it, somebody would have to call it with the uh, the data from the gateway, and it would then go off and consult the resolver, pass the witness data to it, and get back the resolved address, is, if that makes sense. OK, I can try one more time. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so can you walk me through the, the process of like moving from one L2 to a different one? Uh, um. Yes. Yeah, so so to a degree that will depend on how compatible the two L2s are, or rather how compatible the, the gateways integrations are, if you like. So 
if you were moving between, say, two different uh, EVM compatible L2s with similar, um, you know, similar structures, you would have to copy all the data over, and then you have to update your gateway to point to the new L2, or rather replace your gateway with one that, that supports the new L2 instead of the old one. Um, if you were moving from, say, optimism to something that only supports like a bare key value store, then uh, you might have a somewhat more complicated process in copying it over, but the same basic process still holds. Have you, have you considered like if I go into one L2 that I there would basically point and add the address? So it's kind of similar to what you do with L1, but then L2 will just give me a pointer to the next one. So you kind of refer to the to the next address? It's uh... It, it, we could do that, but I think it's probably better to maintain that e, a sort of single level of indirection where ENS is the registry of of mappings to L2s, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, it's, it's more expensive, it's, but I mean, I, I guess I, both of this could, could have benefits, I guess, over time. Yes. I guess the uh, one thing you can do, like if, for instance, uh, you're hosting subdomains on an L2, uh, and your one of your users of those subdomains themselves wants to use a different L2, uh, the more sensible way to handle it might be that you could provide a mechanism to let that person sort of push their registration to L1, at which point it becomes a fully realized name in the ENS registry, and they can set up their own redirection to a different L2. Yeah, that's fair enough. Thanks. Um, uh, I just wanted to expand on uh, Brian's question with the composability. Uh, I think last um, meetup conversation, there's a two points that, for example, something like a graph, uh, we have to come up with ways to how, uh, how do they even let them to index, right? So that's one point. And also the reverse record. I, I think that's the biggest concern I have is like I think reverse record is such a good thing for kind of decentralized identity, but this doesn't work. Uh, is there any, is it still as it is, or is there any better idea, you know? I don't think I understood your first question. So like a graph, uh, currently, first problem if we just do this, all the information about resolver but information won't be indexed by graph. So we have to work, you know, the graph uh, protocol. Yes. of a subgraph so how do we do that that's the first question and the second is reverse record like uh, we will be losing but is there any way we can change how reverse record works so that it does work on the layer two one as well yeah so the, the subgraph will only reflect information that's available on l1 um but its intention, the intention of the subgraph is to provide inf access to information that's that's uh, not available on chain, such as enumerating subdomains and so forth. Uh, and that will continue to function uh, for everything that's on L1. Um, for, for L2s, our manager will have to support the individual L2s that we want to, you know, that, that users are commonly using. Um, and so unlike clients where they resolve it, you know, the same process for everyone, we'll have to build in specific support for each of those L2s. Uh, and whether that requires some sort of subgraph equivalent is sort of an open question. Um, for the reverse records, uh, much like .eth, um, this is something which we would have to redeploy to a particular L2. So, the, you know, the, the big advantage of the system is that it lets the user choose which L2 they use for their names. But in the case of like the reverse registry, you pretty much have to deploy the entire reverse registry to one L2 or not at all. So that means like uh, it's kind of similar to, you know, common questions like, can we not pay gas fee on, fee on registration or renewal on .east? Uh, we can only do that if entire .eth domain moves to specific L2. So this one is also the same. Like we have to decide a winner. Yeah, so, so yes, exactly. Um, and much like other, you know, what I discussed earlier with, with selling subdomains, you'll still be able to push your name to L1 to have it in a fully realized record, but there would only be one L2 that you could register it in most likely. Um, you know, while we could potentially support more than one, it would get exponentially more complicated to do so. So 
those are things we would only want to move over once it's apparent that a particular L2 is here to stay and is, is robust and, and widely used. Jeff, you had your hand up. Yeah, this is um, kind of open question to everyone as well, that um, at some point we might have to standardize a way of specifying which, uh, so especially for EVM compatible chains or L2s like Optimism, we probably have to standardize uh, which L2 we're referring to when we do like an address since they all use the similar addresses. So um, currently we don't we don't do that, and uh, obviously within ENS we've been talking about you know possibly setting a chain ID for specific L2s, but they don't have a chain ID right now. Is there another way we could do this? Um, kind of open question to everyone if um, they wants to thought about this as well. And and just to expand on that a little, it's it's very simple. If the L2 uses a different addressing scheme, we you know we add a chain ID if they haven't got one already, uh, and we add it to our multi-chain support. But if they use the same addressing scheme as Ethereum, uh, the, the question is kind of, do you have a separate record for my address on Optimism from my address on, on L1? Uh, and if you do, then then how do we notate that? And if you don't, then, then how do we make sure that that's clear to everybody? Um, and I think uh, to a degree, this is going to depend on, I mean, my own view is that this is going to depend on the norms that these L2s establish with their communities. Uh, you know, it's technically possible to either use the same address for, for the L2 as you do for the L1, or to use a separate one. Uh, and we probably want to reflect that uh, in ENS as, as much as we can. Um, but then we need to know from those those L1s and L uh, sorry those L2s uh, how they're going to handle this so that we can help the users address things appropriately. All right. Uh, any other questions or feedback or or other ideas relating to L2s? Uh, just wondering what what's the next. So next for our for the, the work on L2 resolution that I demoed is first of all writing up specification for a generic L2 calling standard um, and getting that through the standardization process and uh, trying to get some some client libraries to implement it so that it's widely available. Uh, and then in parallel with that, or at least once we've started that, uh, writing the, the ENS specific bindings for that. Uh, and that also depends on ENS wildcard resolution. Uh, which is something that's been underway for some time. Um, but in order to make this most useful, you need to be able to delegate not just a single name to an L2, but also all of its subdomains. Uh, so that requires us to get that uh, rolled out. And then once we have specifications for both sections of that, we can uh, start uh, getting clients to migrate over to the new resolution process. I've got a question. So, uh... My assumption is that most services that use ENS use a library. Like, and I think even a lot use ethers.js. Hey, Rick. Um, and so for this upgrade, they have to, is, is it, will it be sufficient for there to be a, like a new version library and they just upgrade to the new version library and it will work? Or is there something beyond the library that they're using that's going to be required from them? And they should just be able to upgrade to a new library if they're using one that's upgraded to support this. Because that makes the, that a lot easier. Oh, yes. Uh, who's hosting Gateway? Is it Optimism or by ENS team? So we, this, this also remains to be seen. And of course, anyone can run a Gateway, but we would love to see individual L2 teams running uh, Gateways for their services. Uh, if they're not, we will, um, and, and maybe we can come up with some sort of joint infrastructure initiative, um, or at least we will for at least the ones that ENS uh, manager supports natively. And also what, like, you've done pretty much everything for optimism. Uh, I wonder how, how we kind of get more buy-in from other... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because like, I, I think I was hoping more people from L2 uh, turn up, but like, I don't see anyone turn up. So 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to to know that as well. Uh, hopefully, once we start to roll out a generic standard, they'll see the value of a, of participating in it. Um, but you know, ultimately, we may need to to spend the engineering resources on going to two or three of the the top ones and, and building the integrations ourselves if that's necessary. There might be some good grants. Yes, actually. Uh, Andreas here asked, will this method work similar for reverse resolution? I'm not sure exactly the context. Yeah, so that's what I was discussing just now with uh, Makoto, which is that because you pretty much you pick a node in the ENS hierarchy and you say everything under this is on the cell too, uh, you can do it for reverse resolution, but you would have to do it for all of reverse resolution uh, for it to be useful. Um, so the uh, Chris asks, have any other projects expressed interest in using the L2 gateway standard for non-ENS use cases? Uh, not so far, but so far it's been, uh, you know, the, the, the attention I think has mostly been from the ENS community. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we'll see a lot more attention to it. Um, I suspect it will be useful for, for other projects, but I know the ENS is a little unusual in that we're, uh, the way people can build on top of ENS in a sort of a decentralized fashion and they can extend it arbitrarily is, you know, if you're operating, say, a decentralized exchange or something, then you just don't have this problem that we have that we want our users to be able to use all of these many different L2s. You would basically just pick one. So uh, it's it'll be interesting to see which uh, which applications this assists other than ENS. It's, it's generic, but it's maybe solving a problem that a lot of apps don't have. I'm not sure yet. Do you have any particular app you think you might fit? Uh, that's what I'm saying. I don't know yet. Okay. Uh, and another thing maybe. about that, yep, go on. I was just going to think, I mean, the reason why it's quite specific for ENS is I think uh, we're essentially like a like a database. So I think anything that's like quite high read, maybe oracles or something like that, might might, might be helpful for them. Yeah, that's true. Um, and in fact, yeah, it effectively allows you to, to turn in a Web3 resolution into a Web2 one if you want, and that's okay with your trust model. Um, another thing that occurs, for instance, is uh, NFT contracts that permit, uh, you know, arbitrary users, you know, like the, the generic OpenSea NFT contract, for instance, um, might find it useful to be able to say this entire part of the namespace or the address space of NFTs is served by this particular L2 gateway. Um, well, yeah, sorry, um, what, what one? Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, Rick says, uh, reverse resolutions only advisories. So you could potentially query multiple reverse L2 things and then forward look up each name to get the result, uh, get name results for those. Possibly, uh, but part of the structure of this, um, of the current uh, visual, vision of the implementation is that there is no ENS root on optimism, for instance. It's purely what your particular gateway and your particular resolver points to. So there wouldn't necessarily be an authoritative place you'd go to on optimism to do the reverse resolution. Uh, unless, of course, we deployed a separate reverse registry to each of these, in which case we'd effectively be, be uh, blessing which implementations we cared about. I, I guess yeah. I was thinking, oh, sorry, can you jump in for one second? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Awesome, awesome. Sorry. I came late. I totally, this was not my calendar. Um, I was thinking basically you could imagine if there's multiple um, L2s out there who are all trying to do the reverse registration. If I ask L2, L2A the name and it says Rick Moo and L2B says Nick, once I actually go to do the forward resolution, that's going to have an authoritative result, right? I can actually search the forward for Nick and it's authoritative for Rick Moo. And only one of those is going to resolve back to the, the, the reverse record. Yep, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just kind of trying to do the same because otherwise, if you only have one and move it to, for example, optimism, it's almost making it uh, impractical for other L2 providers to even use. So it might disincentivize people. You know, like you might have like ZK roll up solution, but you still have to go to optimism to set reverse record. That's almost like a impractical mm -hmm. to use. So I do, I, I really like like uh, Richard's solution, like you know, 
for loop to double check, then it doesn't really matter which reverse record on you know which platform it's being set because you can just set the forward one to dictate which one it is. So I really like which other idea. Hmm. All right, uh, time for one last question before we wrap up for a break. If not, uh, then I guess we're done. And thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming and uh, for witnessing this historic first demo, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and uh, see you all in 10 minutes. Yes, yeah. Thank you. See you.